the, one of the hardest things about uh, living in Saskatchewan is the winters. Do you, guys, do you guys find that? Maybe it's just me, but man, it's dark and it's cold and I don't love them, even though I try to make the best of them and try to get out skating and doing winter things. And um, the, thing, the thing about winter that I don't like is the obvious, the cold, the darkness, uh, the misery. And <laughs> sounds like such a Debbie Downer. Uh, but what I do love about winter is the anticipation of spring. Spring is coming. You know when spring starts to come and the, you get a hot day, the occasional hot day as spring starts to, to, to come and, 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 and you see the snow melting and it's kind of like this in spring. It's like, yeah, spring, you get your bikes out, you're ready to rock and then, then the next day there's a blizzard. Well, that's, that's kind of how, how Saskatchewan the transition between Saskatchewan winters and Saskatchewan spring happens. But there's this anticipation that you feel when you start to see the sun come out. And you're like, finally. I, I think about the Narnia series, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, if you've seen that. You know, in the story, there's uh, it's winter all the time. And the White Witch uh, for winter, it went, the winter in Narnia represents the evil. And when Aslan comes, who Aslan represents God in the Narnia series, when Aslan comes... Uh, the snow begins to melt and the flowers begin to bloom and new life uh, begins to happen. And that's kind of how I think about spring. There's this anticipation when you start to see the grass show and you, you start to get the hot weather. And uh, there, there's lots of things that, that uh, make us anticipate various things. We think about... Um, you know, maybe a trip, upcoming trip, or a wedding, or maybe you got plans to go to your favorite restaurant. That sense of anticipation. And it, anticipation is that, that I, the literal meaning really of anticipation is, is is looking forward to a pleasurable expectation. And so, when winter ends, we look forward to a pleasurable expectation where we get to to enjoy the hot weather. Now, Revelation nineteen. There's a sense of anticipation that begins to build, and it builds very quickly. We're nearing the end. There's only 22 chapters in Revelation, so we're nearing the end. And as we reach Revelation 19, what we're going to look at this morning, we've been sort of in this this dark period of Revelation, and now we begin to see the snow begins to melt, okay? The, the, the grass begins to show. There's this sense of anticipation. There's no more Babylon because remember, Revelation 18, we talked about the destruction of Babylon. There's no more Babylon. It says over and over, no more, right? No more of her seduction. No more of uh, security and riches and uh, to bring purpose and meaning. No more um, of the seduction of Babylon. All the no mores that we saw in Revelation 18, uh, you, you begin to see this anticipation being birthed in 19. So that's what we're going to look at. You might call Revelation, uh, and some have called Revelation the tale of two women, the prostitute of Babylon and the bride of the Lamb. So the two, the prostitute of Babylon and the bride of the Lamb, sort of come together in Revelation 19, and their destinies could not be more radically different. So anticipation's building. We, we know that anticipation's building because I don't know if you noticed as Chantel read this, the word hallelujah. Hallelujah comes four times in Revelation 19. Now I want you to think for a minute, if you're familiar with the Bible, I want you to think of another time in the New Testament where you see the word hallelujah. Do you, can you think of another time in uh, the New Testament where you think of the word hallelujah? You can't, can you? Because in the New Testament, the only time that hallelujah is used is in Revelation 19. In all of the New Testament, the only place you're going to find that word is in Revelation 19, what we just looked at. And there's, it comes up four times in Revelation 19. You, you won't find it anywhere else in the New Testament. Okay, so the word hallelujah, when you, when you see, see people, you hear people say it, the word actually means you praise God. So hallelujah is you praise. Yah is, is the word Yahweh, which represents God. You praise God, Yahweh. All right, so hallelujah. That's, that's what hallelujah means. You praise God. Now, there's a reason why John uses the word hallelujah. 
And, and I, want, I want to take you there because it will help you understand what John is doing. John is connecting some things here. And, 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 and you don't see, again, you don't see this word hallelujah anywhere in the New Testament other than Revelation 19. So in the Old Testament, the word is used most often in the book of Psalms, which is right in the middle of your Bible. If you open up your Bibles to the middle, you'll probably land right in Psalms. And, and in Psalms is where this word hallelujah is used again. And in fact, if you, if you take this, this is an aside, but if you take the, the exact middle of the Bible, if you took all the verses in the Bible and you, and you found the exact middle of the Bible, the middle of the Bible, Psalm 103, 1 and 2, it says this, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my innermost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So Psalms is all about the worship of the Lord, the worship of the Lord. Now, in Psalms, there's a particular grouping of Psalms called uh, Psalms 113 to to 118. So Psalms 113 to 118 are called the you, you praise Psalms. These are significant because in these particular grouping of Psalms is where you find the verb hallelujah most often used. Who cares, Blair? Who cares? Well, hang with me because there's something really significant that I want you to see here as we unpack this for a moment, okay? In John 19, as uh, or in Revelation 19, as John uses the word hallelujah, he's making, he's making the connection. There's some aha moments that are connecting to the first century readers that are reading what John has written. Okay, so, so let's, let's look at this together. Now, I'm going to take us back to the story of the Exodus. And in the story of the Exodus, the book of Exodus is all about the Israelites being freed from the captivity of the Egyptians. And the Egyptians were cruel and they were awful to the Israelites for 400 years. They, they, they experienced this and it just got harder and harder and harder. And God called this man Moses and, and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and to, uh, to, to broker on God's behalf, if you will, the, the deliverance of the Israelites from the evil and wicked hand of the Egyptians. Now, one of the things that God did to display his power to the Egyptians during this deliverance was he did the plagues that most of you are familiar with, right? You've heard the Exodus story, the Prince of Egypt. Maybe you saw that movie years ago. The final plague that God performed to reveal his glory and his power, the final plague that he did was called the Passover. It was the pass, the plague was, uh, that an angel of death was going to come in the night and it was going to kill the firstborn of every home. And, and, and God through Moses told the people that if they want to be spared from this angel of death, that they need to take the blood of a lamb and they need to put it on the doorpost, the lintels, or they put it around their door, okay? And, and the angel would see that there was blood poured out. Uh, that they were, that the blood that was poured out atoned for them. Atoning means covering. So the blood atoned for them and covered them. It protected them. And then the angel seeing that blood would fly over that home and the firstborn in that home would not be killed. Now after this event, this significant event in the history of Israel, Every year, the Israelites would gather together, and most of them would come to Jerusalem, and they would gather together, and they would celebrate the Passover every single year. They would eat, they would gather, they would remember God's goodness to them, how he delivered them. Uh, They would recount the stories passed on uh, from one generation to the other, and they would sing hymns and songs together. Now, what they would sing are these particular psalms from Psalm 1. 13 to 118. They would sing Psalms 113 and Psalms 114 before they ate the Passover meal. And then after the Passover meal, they would, they would sing, uh, Psalm 115 to Psalm 118. These are the you praise Psalms. So these Psalms are praising God for his deliverance of the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians. Are you guys still with me? Yes. Okay. Good. Now, if we look to the Gospels, particularly if we look at Mark's Gospel, the, re- the Gospels are uh, the recounting of Jesus' life and ministry. Um, the week before he went to the cross, he went to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. And as he's celebrating, he's eating with his disciples. And they're, they're doing what they would do every year. They would gather to celebrate 
uh, the Passover. And during this meal, Jesus takes, uh, t- takes a cup and he, and he instituted this new covenant or this new meal. And he says, he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Right? We call this communion. We call this the Lord's Supper that we partake together every week. So the new covenant in my blood is what Jesus says to the disciples. Now Mark 14, 26 tells us that the disciples then sang, uh, they sang together. Well, what they were doing is what they would do every year. They would sing these you praise psalms. Okay, Psalm 113 to 118. Either singing them all or or, or singing uh, parts of, of them. But this is what they would do. So this was the normal rhythm for a Jewish person every year to celebrate the Passover. God's deliverance. And they praised him. And they praised him for his deliverance. And they praised him for his grace to them. Now here's what's important to understand. And why this is connected to Revelation 19. The celebration was that God's delivered um the Israelites from the hand of the Egyptians, this gave birth to to hope, along with the words of the prophets and the teachers in Scripture, that one day God would deliver his people again. So the first hallelujahs, the first ones, they were sung because God delivered his people from Egypt. The second hallelujahs in Revelation 19, they're sung because God delivered us from Babylon. So God's delivered us, not just from the cruel hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, but he's delivered us from Babylon, from all that is opposed to God. This is what we see in Revelation 18, the destruction of Babylon. This is what we're seeing in Revelation 19. Hallelujah! God has delivered us. All that seeks to make false idols, Babylon. All that is opposed to God, Babylon. All that draws worship away from God, Babylon. That is no more. God has delivered us from that. So chapter 18, again, describes the destruction. Chapter 19 celebrates God's deliverance. So you see the significance of John using the word hallelujah because the first century readers would say, well, 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 that's connecting us to what we do at Passover. Jesus delivered us from the hand of the Egyptians and, and, and he promised he would deliver us from all suffering and tears and pain and all those things. And now they're celebrating the deliverance that God brings them from the hand of Babylon, all that's opposed to God. So it's very significant when you read the word hallelujah four times in Revelation 19. So hallelujah is sung at the Passover meal celebrating this deliverance from Egypt. Now, hallelujah is sung because a new meal is at hand. The feast that celebrates the greater deliverance won through the blood of the Lamb. Bet you never saw that when you read Revelation 19. Uh, it's, it's incredible when I look at scripture and I see how weaved together and I see this scarlet thread of the redemptive work of Jesus threaded throughout the, all, throughout all of scripture. And you see the over 500 connections in Revelation to the Old Testament and the, the allusions to the Old Testament in Revelation. It's so powerful. It's so amazing. So let's look at this together and read it once again. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, How Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So we praise God. Hallelujah! For his salvation, we praise God for his glory. We praise God for his power, his true and just judgments. We praise God for his judgment of the notorious prostitute Babylon. And we praise God that he's avenged the blood of the saints killed by her hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You remember in Revelation, we looked at this where it it describes the blood of the saints gathering underneath the 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 um uh the uh, in in the temple the um the table what altar sorry couldn't think of that word so the the, the blood of the saints gathered underneath the altar the, the 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 
the saints that have been martyred because they follow Jesus throughout history, their blood is crying out, God, when will you avenge our blood that's spilled in your name? And, and we see, hallelujah, he's avenged their blood. Hallelujah, he's destroyed Babylon. Once more they cried out, second time, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. She's no more. She's no, no more seduction, no more deceit. Verse four, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures, so that's all of humanity from the four corners of the earth, fell down and they worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Now, who's the voice from the throne? Well, it might be Jesus, but more likely it's the voice of one of the angels that serve at the throne of God. It, it's, really, it's really not the who that matters, it's the what. The worship and the praise of God. That's what matters. So Babylon's destruction brings heaven and earth together. And the hallelujahs show us that we're nearing the end and, and, and we're celebrating the deliverance of God from Babylon. If we were in the midst of Narnia, the snow would be melting. The buds would be blooming. I mean, Aslan is, is coming. Aslan is coming. Now, the second reason we know we're on the home stretch, not only in terms of the chapters of Revelation, but, but, but what Revelation teaches us that we're on the home stretch is what, what follows. And what follows is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage supper of the Lamb. So the first part worships God for what he's, what, what's been done, right? The destruction of Babylon. The second part points us forward to the wedding of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. So then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah. There's the fourth hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. God is praised because he reigns. Never once has he not reigned. Never once has he not reigned. Never once was he not sitting on his throne. Hallelujah. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Hallelujah. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now throughout the Bible, the arrival of God's kingdom, the arrival of the new heavens and the new earth is spoken of uh, as entering into a great feast. It's spoken of using wedding language. All right, for example, Isaiah 25, 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of, of aged wine, well-defined. Uh, many places we could look. You could look at Matthew 22, where Jesus is telling the parable of the marriage feast. And he starts the parable in, in verse 2. He says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So you have this wedding language used to describe the new heavens and the new earth. All right, let's continue. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are... Um, invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Don't worship me. Worship God. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, like many passages in the Bible, we can quickly read them. And because we don't necessarily understand the context uh, or the background, we can just fly over them and not understand the depth. And the depth here is incredible. It's incredible. The long-awaited day of the marriage supper of the Lamb. So our Lord Jesus and his bride, the church. The church is described as the bride of Christ. So we see, again, this wedding language. Now, 
as we've looked through Revelation, we've seen God describe the church, his people, in a variety of ways. We've seen uh, the church be called priests. We've seen the church be called witnesses, martyrs. Uh, the church has been described as 144,000, for example, to describe the church and, and a few others as well. Now we come to a place that Jesus wants us to grasp and to live. We are called to be his bride. We are called to be his bride. Jesus is the groom. The church is the bride. The church is described as the bride of Christ. This is important for us to understand. And several times throughout scripture, you're going to see, you're going to see this imagery and this, uh, this descriptive language to symbolize the relationship of God with his people as seen through this picture of marriage of marriage. There's an, there's an intimate nature between God and his people, the church. And it's described as, uh, uh, as, as marriage language, as, as husband and wife. The church is the bride. Okay. So here's some examples for you. Uh, you, there's, there's lots of examples in scripture. Let me just give you a, a couple. Second Corinthians 11 verse two. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present yourself as a pure virgin to Christ. Or look at Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So you see the connection, this this marriage language that's used uh, throughout the Bible. So we are the bride of the Lamb. We are the bride of the Lamb. Jesus is the husband of the people of God. You might remember John the Baptist, who's the cousin of Jesus, when Jesus uh, came to be baptized in the Jordan River by uh, by John. Uh, so this is John 3.29. He, he calls, he, he identifies himself, John, uh, Jesus' cousin, as the friend of the bridegroom. He identifies himself as the best man. All right, so way to go, John. So in chapter 19, John is saying something about the disciples of Jesus. To make sense of what John's showing us here, we need to, we need to understand the marriage customs of first century Judaism. Right? It's, it's unfamiliar with us. There's, there's some similarities to our marriage customs today, but there are an awful lot of differences. And we're not going to fully understand what Jesus is talking about here and what John is unpacking in Revelation 19 if we don't have a sense of what uh, the marriage process was in the first century. The, this letter was written to first century uh, people. And so, so we need to understand this. So what's going on? Now, in a similar way, uh, to us today, to, to them in that day when they got married, there was two major events, okay? So the first event was the engagement. The second event was the wedding. In the first century, engagement was called betrothal. Betrothal was, was n- not the same kind of uh, idea that we have. So the idea of betrothal is, um, is not very similar to engagement today, but it's, it's got the same, same idea. So you remember... Um, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, it says in scripture that she was betrothed to be married to Joseph. So uh, in our modern lingo, we might say she was engaged to be married to Joseph. But betrothal was very different than engagement. So today we think of engagement, um, it's like a lot of people think of engagement like you're buying a new car. And, and you, you got you to try it out. You got you to gotta see if you like it. And if you don't like it, you don't buy it. Right? So Today's engagement is treated by many as sort of an escape clause. We're going to put our foot in the water and we're just going to see how it goes. And then I have an out. I have an out if I just, if I don't like where this is going. But you see, in the first century, betrothal meant that the two individuals uh, were, were legally husband and wife. But they were separated. Even though they were legally husband and wife, they were separated for a time uh, before the wedding. So what I mean by that is that legally they were husband and wife, which means that they had the same uh, obligations of faithfulness to one another as husband and wife. And, and so legally in betrothal, they were married. In fact, if in the betrothal period, 
um, the man dies, the woman would be considered a widow. So is is legally binding. If if something happened uh, during betrothal, um, it would be considered divorce in that day. So very very different than how we understand engagement in, in our culture. So this is why when Mary, the mother of Jesus, was pregnant with by the Holy Spirit with our Lord, then. Um, Joseph took her away because they were betrothed, and if word got out that she was pregnant, uh, then it would then the obvious conclusion would be because they weren't allowed to be together or to sleep together at that during the betrothal that she had an affair. So she would she would get stoned. She would she would pay pay the consequences of that. So that's why Joseph took her away. So betrothal is very, very significant. Now let me show you the process of how marriage and betrothal would happen in the first century. Now let's imagine, let's imagine, it's the first century and I'm, I'm Jewish and I've fallen in love with a beautiful young maiden named Sharon. Okay, so let's imagine this. I've watched her for some time. I've seen her at the well. I'm, I've seen her feed donkeys like nobody's business. Okay? I, I've chatted with her a few times and she had me at hello. Okay? I, I can't even imagine. I can't imagine life without her. I can't sleep all night. All I do is I think about her. When I see her, I say to her, you fill my heart with gladness. You take away all my sadness. Ease my trouble. That's what you do. Thanks, Rod Stewart. Um, so with all this love in my heart for Sharon, what do I do in the first century? Well, I'd go over to Sharon's house and I'd sit down with her dad and I would talk to her dad and I would say to her dad, you know, I really love Sharon. I want to provide for her. I want to care for her. I want to marry her. And after some discussions with her dad, uh, we would, we would come to an agreement. We'd come to an agreement. We would settle on a purchase price that I would pay to the family in order to have the privilege of marrying Sharon. Now, this could be money, this could be livestock, whatever the agreement that we decided upon, whatever we decided upon, that was the purchase price. Now, in those days, women were bought with a price. Women were bought with a price. Now, this seems strange to us. And you're thinking to yourself, does this mean that she was some kind of slave? That's, that's It's not about ownership. Right? You didn't give a purchase price to own your wife. Now you have to remember that this society was an agricultural society. And, and so most people made their living from the farm. So when you gave a purchase price, you were, you were in essence compensating the family for taking uh, that worker for, who works on the farm with her family. You were taking that worker, you're taking revenue from the farm. So you're compensating the family for removing that from their Far from their world, from their life. Because the bride after marriage would cease uh, helping out on her family farm and she would go to her husband's farm, the groom's farm, and she would work there. So it's an advantage for you, but it's a disadvantage for the family. So you paid a purchase price. So women were bought with a price, not for ownership, to compensate lost revenue, lost work that would take place when you remove someone from the home like that. It was a normal and it was a, uh, an expected part of the marriage process. Now, once Sharon and my, Sharon's dad and myself agreed on a price, I would happily pay it to be able to spend the rest of my life with my beautiful young Jewish maiden, Sharon. Now, at that point, once, once we agreed and once I uh, paid the purchase price, marriage technically would, would go into effect. So we're legally married. Although at this point we don't live together, we're, we're not consummating the, the marriage, we, we're, 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 not, we're, not, we're not together at this point, okay? At this point, Sharon would be declared consecrated to me, the groom. And if I died, Sharon would be considered a widow. She is now, because the purchase price has been paid, she is now set apart exclusively for me. Yes. A new covenant has been established between Sharon and I and and myself and Sharon's dad. And as a sign and as a seal of the new covenant, here's what would happen. 
we, we take a cup of wine, and as we took the cup of wine, the father would say a betrothal benediction that would be this. This cup is a new covenant. This cup is a new covenant. Now, following this, I would leave Sharon, and I would go back to my uh, father's farm, and I would be there for around 12 months, give or take a few months. And while Sharon and I are apart, anticipation grows. Can't wait to be with her. Uh, what's she going to look like on the, the, the day that we finally can be together? All that anticipation grows. I can't, I can't wait. So it's building. And while we're apart, I'm preparing for her a room on my family's farm, a place for us to be together. I'm preparing a room for my bride in my father's house. And while I'm preparing that room, and I'm Pinteresting all the things that Sharon likes, as I'm preparing this, Sharon's back at her family farm, and she's preparing herself and her her friends, and they're making the dresses, and they're getting ready for the wedding, and she's preparing herself for the wedding. So this is around around 12 months or so. Now, after that time was up, after the 12 months, I would dress up in my very best. And I would, along with my friends, we would go over to Sharon's family farm. And it was with great joy, Sharon and her friends would come out and they'd meet me and my friends. Then the wedding feast would begin. And all those people would come back to my farm, my family farm, and we would have a wedding feast. And that wedding feast might be seven days. It might go as long as 14 days. Imagine paying that bill, Father. So everyone would go back and we would, we would just kick off this feast together. That's how marriage, betrothal and marriage worked in the first century. This is significant to know. Well, in Jerusalem, when, when Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room, what does he do? He takes a cup of wine and he gives it to his disciples and he says this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He's saying, in effect, I love you. I give you my life. Will you marry me? It's not some kind of creepy, will you marry me? It's, obviously, it's symbolic. He's tapping into their understanding of the intimacy of marriage in the first century. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Remember what, what Sharon's dad did to me when we had that new covenant? When I paid a purchase price? For her? Then he tells his, his disciples, what does he say? He says, I'm leaving. And where, you, where I'm going, you can't come yet. What does the groom do? He leaves. John 13, 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Then Jesus says this in John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's the bridegroom, the husband of the people of God. We are his bride. He paid the purchase price. And that purchase price was his own blood. He sealed the the betrothal with a cup of wine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. My purchase price is my blood for you. And every time we drink of the communion cup together, we hear the words, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. God is saying, I love you and I invite you to be my spiritual bride. And every time we drink it, we're in effect saying this, I accept your gift. And I give you my life in return. So Jesus asked his father the night before he died. He said this in Matthew 26, 39. 
If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. See, Jesus knew the high price he would have to pay to purchase his bride. He knew the high price that he would have to pay to become our spiritual husband. He's our groom, and we, the church, are his bride, bought with a tremendous price. The price of his shed blood to purchase us and to make us his own. He, his shed blood set us apart. It consecrated us, and it made us his own. We're consecrated to the groom. Blessed is everyone who's invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to draw this to a close by looking at a couple of verses that we sort of jumped over fairly quickly. I'm going to put them up on the screen here, and I want you to try to determine for yourselves if you notice any tension between the verses 7 and 8. Let me read this. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's verse 7. Verse 8. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, if, if, you're, if you're paying attention between 7 and 8, you're going to notice that there's a tension here. Now, here's the tension that you can see. On one hand, in verse 7, the bride has made herself ready. And then in verse 8, it was granted to her, it was given to her to clothe herself. So which is it? Did she get herself ready? Or did he give her something that made her ready? What's the answer? The answer is yes. Yes. The same tension that we find in verses 7 and 8 of Revelation 19 is the same tension that you're going to find in other passages such as Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Listen to this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always, obe always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see that tension there again. See, we need to understand this, friends, because John is teaching us something here. We need to understand that, that we can't get ourselves ready for the wedding on our own. Right? We're being prepared as a bride for Jesus and by Jesus. So what you see here is that God is the implied agent behind the action. So to be dressed appropriately for this wedding is going to require that that we're provided with the perfect righteousness of another. The righteousness of Jesus given to us as a gift. The purchase price has been paid. The grace given to us will also go to work in us so that we'll be able to, as, as Colossians 3 says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another and above all, all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So as, as God works in us, he works through us. As God works in us, he works through us. The righteousness of our groom is going to work in and through our lives in such a way that that righteousness will be evident through our lives. This is how we grow. As Christ followers, the process of growing in the Bible is described by this big fancy word uh, called sanctification, that Jesus sanctifies us, that the spirit of God is working in us to sanctify us. This is how we grow. Sanctification is just, is just the way that God works, works in us and through us. We grow when God works in us and we grow when we work out what God is working in us. I say this many times, and you, most of you are familiar with this, but you can understand how God sanctifies us, his work in us and his work through us by understanding it like a bicycle, the pedals on a bike. Okay, so as God initiates, we respond. 
As God initiates, we respond. And as we respond to God's working in our lives, you see forward progress of the gospel in your life. That's how we grow as Christians. So, so like a bike, when you push down on that pedal, you start to have movement. You start to move forward. And, and what happens is, friends, is that oftentimes as God begins to stir things in our life, convict us of things in our life, rather than respond to those things in repentance and submitting ourselves to Jesus, we just kind of, you know, when you put both feet on the pedal and no foot is going to move and you're just going to hold it there and you're not going to go anywhere, that's what happens. See, see, when God initiates, we respond he initiates, we respond. And sometimes, you know, when you become a new Christian, oftentimes it's like, oh, God's initiating, he's doing all these things, and that bike's just ripping down the street. And then after a while, then, then the, the outer layers of your heart are peeled away, and now it's just deep-seated things in your life, and that's a lot harder. That's a lot harder. And God is, is consistently prodding us and, and by the work of his spirit, teaching us and sanctifying us and initiating these things in our lives so, so that we can respond and we can see the forward progress of the, of the gospel in our lives. This, this is the truth that's revealed to us in Revelation 19. So it's, it's both. It's yes. God is working in us. And as he's working in us, he works through us. So let's look at this. God works in us. A while ago, uh, our, we have a, a PlayStation, an older PlayStation at home, and the HDMI port stopped working on it. So uh, because I'm cheap, I, uh, I bought a HDMI thing online, and I was like, well, how hard can it be? I'm going to open this thing up. I'm just going to take out the old one, and I'm going to solder on a new HDMI fitting. And so I... Got all the parts, I got all these things, I have no working knowledge of fixing electronics. So I called a friend and I said, uh, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm having a bit of a problem here. He said, well, I'll give you some tools, some things that might help. So uh, he gave me some tools and I tried to, um, you know, on the pictures, they always seem so big. And then you open it up and you're like, I can barely see that, those those solder things with my, with my eyes. They're so, they're so small. They're so small. There was no chance that I was going to be able to fix that myself. There was no chance. I simply didn't have what it takes to do it myself. It's the same way in the Christian life. How do we change? We don't have a chance of changing ourselves. But the great news is this. God has shown up and he has all the right tools. And he's very good at changing us. And the minute that we follow Jesus, God completely changes us. We're forgiven. We're cleansed. We're given new hearts. It says in scriptures that the heart of stone is replaced with a heart of flesh. In another sense, the work of working out that salvation is ongoing. God initiates, we respond. And that's God's work too. So how do we change? God comes into our lives and he changes us. He, he brings us life, right? life everlasting. But then he continues to change us as he roots out all the things in our lives where we've adopted the spirit of Babylon. And he's at work and he's changing you and he's changing me. Thank God. Thank God. And the second way we change is, well, the first way is God working in us. That's the first part. But then we change by working out what God has already, uh, what God has already worked. So we're working out what God is doing. We grow when God works in us. A good way to understand this is uh, uh, author John Ortberg describes, you know, you can picture crossing the ocean. You're crossing the ocean and you're in a rowboat by yourself. You'll never cross the ocean. Right? We, we don't have what it takes. But if we just drift expecting God to blow us across the ocean, that's not going to work either. Neither trying nor drift, drifting are effective in bringing about spiritual transformation. So when we say God is working in us, that doesn't mean that we just get to sit in the rowboat and do nothing. And do nothing. Drifting's dangerous. There's an intentionality that comes with uh, 
our spiritual lives. There's an intentionality that says God wants this for us. God is working this out in us. There's an intentionality that we respond to what God is doing. A better image would be to understand it as a sailboat, right? which if it moves at all, it's a gift of the wind. We can't control the wind, but a good sailor discerns where the wind is blowing and will adjust the sails accordingly. So God works, and then we work out what God is working in us. God calls us to, to himself. And then in relationship with himself, he begins to free us, especially from the captivity of Babylon and the things that, 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 that captivate our hearts. And he begins to empower us to live out this new life. What's the purpose of that? The, the new life that God wants to do in us is so that we would reflect him to the world. Our new life leads to new deeds, the righteous deeds of the saints. That's what Revelation 19, 8 tells us. So that's why we're called deeds of the saints, deeds of those who are already saved and being saved, deeds not done, not done in order to, to, uh, to get salvation or to, to be in relationship with Jesus, but because we're in a relationship with Jesus. He makes us ready by enabling us to be ready. It's the primary, uh, it is primary in his work. Okay, so in Revelation 21, we're going to get there. Revelation 21, 11, John speaks of the bride as having the glory of God. It, it, it is having the glory of God that prepares the bride. Now, as the church, we're engaged to the lamb. And then we have a, a, a call to loyalty, don't we? We have a call to loyalty to the Lamb. When, to be ready when the bridegroom comes. Right? Think of that first century betrothal and what that looks like. We have an obligation to be ready. The bridegroom has gone and is preparing a room in the Father's house. I can't hardly wait to get to Revelation 21 and 22. I can't wait. You're going to see all that's prepared for those that are in Christ. And as he's preparing the room, we are preparing ourselves, the, the righteous acts of the saints, all those little and some big acts of loyalty, slowly but surely changing us from glory to glory, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. All those sacred moments when we say, I am yours, Jesus accumulate into an even deeper intimacy with him. So the joy of our lives, friends, the blessing of our lives now and into the future is that we've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But you haven't been invited simply as a guest. You've been invited as the bride. As the bride. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, Thank you for this morning and for these words. God, your scriptures are so precious to us. And I just pray, Lord, that, that you would take these, the prodding of the Spirit in our lives this morning and that you would uh, poke and prod around our heart, even if that's uncomfortable, so that when you initiate, we would respond. And, and God, thank you for the vivid picture of your love for us as displayed in this picture of betrothal and marriage and this wedding feast and you've prepared that for us and we are your bride hallelujah and so god i just pray that we would understand that deep in our hearts as we leave from this place this morning and as we live out what it means to be your light your reflection to the world around us we give you thanks in your name amen